methyl alcohol flame tests. There's been a lot of tragedy with methyl alcohol flame tests, and that's a shame. And what we want to do today is review in precise detail how to conduct and work safely with methyl alcohol in flame tests. A wonderful demonstration with great historical significance, but only if done properly. When you go on an airplane flight, what are the, what, what are the, what's the pilot doing as you get on the airplane? The pilot and the first officer, they're going through a pre-flight checklist. What are they doing? Just sitting there talking, having a drink of coffee? No. They're going through a series of stepwise procedures, and they're checking each one off as they do it. They're checking the wing flaps. They're che checking the thrusters, a variety of other things. You're not thinking at all about it. When you do the methyl alcohol flame test, I want you to think of it in terms of doing a pre-flight checklist. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to review that. And you can't rely on memory because you get tired. You get agitated. You get distracted. Somebody comes in needs to go to the bathroom. I don't care. Go to the bathroom. You know, you get distracted. You can't let anything interfere with your thought process when you're going to do the methyl alcohol flame test. Working safely with methyl alcohol. What do we have to do? First of all, as we're setting up, we have no flames, no sparks, or electrical equipment. Okay? We've removed all of the flammable materials from the surface here, and we're going to remove the last one very much at the end. No open methyl alcohol bottles once you start the demonstration. We're going to add the methyl alcohol to our Petri dishes, and then we're going to cap it and we're going to take it far away from the demonstration. Very important. Once you start the methyl alcohol flame test, you never add more alcohol after starting the demonstration. Not ever. When the accidents occur, it's always because the flames flash back into the methyl alcohol bottle. You cannot allow that to happen. We have a flame resistant surface and we've also put these ceramic pads under each borosilicate petri dish. These are all Pyrex borosilicate petri dishes. Do not use watch glasses. You can't tell if that watch glass is borosilicate glass or not. Borosilicate glass petri dishes, you should check them before you use them to make sure there are no cracks or other things in them. We have a fire extinguisher right here behind us. We are ready. We are poised. Okay. What I've got here are five petri dishes. I filled them with various salts. I have lithium chloride in the first one, strontium chloride in the second, sodium chloride Third, copper chloride, that's the only one you can tell what it is because of the color. And finally, potassium chloride. What I'm going to do is using a large jumbo pipette, I'm going to add about two pipettefuls of methyl alcohol to each one. Okay. Methyl alcohol has a very, very low flash point. So you want to do just this. Now the methyl alcohol dissolves the salts and so they form solutions. You can see that in the case of the copper one because you can see that the liquid is green. The exact amount, of course, doesn't matter. So I have the methyl alcohol there. I'm going to take that and put it away. I am going to cap this methyl alcohol bottle. I'm going to go off camera here, and I'm going to take it as far away as I can, and then come back. Don't, it's OK. I am going to take the lights down, and then I am going to light these, and we're going to observe that. I have no alcohol bottle here. I'm going to go ahead and start lighting, and you can then take the lights down then. Now the very first thing that you see 
is not very interesting because I don't, ha I really have almost a colorless flame. One of the dangers of working with methyl alcohol is that flame is almost colorless. As the salt dissolves in that methyl alcohol, I'm going to start to see the characteristic color. On the lithium, I'm beginning to see the first hints of red, orange on the strontium, yellow on the sodium, green. The, the potassium at the end is going to be a very faint color. Do we want to take the lights down maybe a little bit more? so we can see those characteristic colors of the flame test. I do have, very nice, notice it takes a while to get those colors. You can't get, you know, to the point where, oh, it's not happening yet. The lithium is a beautiful, beautiful red, violet color there. The strontium, for some reason, I'm only seeing the tinges of the orange yet. I'm not seeing as much. Do we want to maybe go down just a little bit on the lights? Oh, now we're seeing the orange there, the green, the yellow. So we've got red lithium, orange strontium, yellow sodium, green copper, and a very faint purple on the, uh, on the potassium. I'll let those and what you can do is simply let them go until they've uh, dissipated the methyl alcohol. It won't take that long, but you can't rush it at all. Once you have started this demonstration, that's it. You don't do anything else. You want to let that methyl alcohol burn out. I do have the tops to these Petri dishes here. So if I wanted to, at the end, extinguish them, I could do that very simply by placing the, uh, the cover on top of that Petri dish. I'm just going to cover this. Just that one has burned out. So has this one. We've extinguished all of the flames there. This is a wonderful demonstration in terms of the historical significance of basically flame tests and the sensitivity of that flame to how much sodium. Um, the colors of the salts, the characteristic colors, are due to atomic emission spectra. The emission of light when, those, when the atoms are excited by the heat of the methyl alcohol burning, that excites, they absorb the energy, electrons are excited to higher energy levels, when they uh, drop back down to the ground state, the release energy, that characteristic emission is, is, that emission is characteristic of each salt, and so each one burns a different color. You can look at emission spectra using a spectroscope. Uh, several of the uh, metals were discovered based on their spectra after Bunsen had uh, developed and refined the Bunsen burner, and he and a person named Kirchhoff had worked on developing a spectroscope. They then looked through the spectroscope and they discovered elements that had not previously been known, and they named them based on their flame colors. So cesium was detected first based on its characteristic emission spectrum when burned in a Bunsen burner flame, and uh, the cesium is named for its characteristic sky blue color, comes from the Latin word for the sky or for heavens. Rubidium was also first demonstrated among other alkali metals based on its color. And there again, that was how the element was discovered. The color of its flame is a characteristic deep ruby red, and that's where the rub name rubidium comes from. So from an historical point of view, from discussing atomic and electron structure, a very good demonstration, absolutely critical that when you're doing the flame tests, you go through, just like pilots do, a pre-flight checklist, and you check things off, one after the other. Don't do this if you're distracted. Don't do it if you're tired. That's when accidents happen. That's when you'll forget something.